Funding for Yale Cancer Answers is provided by Smilo Cancer Hospital. Welcome to Yale Cancer Answers with Dr. Anise Chagpar. Yale Cancer Answers features the latest information on cancer care by welcoming oncologists and specialists who are on the forefront of the battle to fight cancer. This week, it's a conversation about palliative care in the ICU with Dr. Kathleen Atkin. Dr. Atkin is an associate professor of pulmonary medicine at the Yale School of Medicine, where Dr. Chagpar is a professor of surgical oncology. So Kathleen, maybe we can start off by you telling us a little bit more about yourself and what it is you do. Sure. I came to New Haven through New Jersey um, and trained in internal medicine residency, stayed on for fellowship, and was able to kind of cultivate my interests in palliative and end-of-life care through uh, the hospice and palliative program at Yale. And uh, intermittently, I'm able to serve clinically in that capacity while also focusing on health services research on palliative medicine as well as some other areas. So, you know, when we think about palliative care, um, we don't often associate it with ICUs. We think of ICUs as being these intensive places where, you know, people have lines in and aggressive management. And when we think of palliative care, we tend to think of, you know, comfort measures, end of life, keeping people comfortable. Tell us how those two intermingle. Sure. And thank you for raising that question. I think that's a common misperception by many that it's either all on, you know, full pedal to the metal gas being delivered for ICU care or peeling things back and only focusing on end-of-life care. But there is a gray zone, and these things can be delivered concurrently. What I mean specifically is that that sort of aggressive care that's delivered with lines and um, intensive care level medicine with mechanical ventilation and other measures of life support can be delivered while we're also discussing with patients and with their families what matters most given where we are for their medical conditions. And what I mean by that is that the situation continues to evolve and change as we're taking care of somebody who has a primary condition that's gotten worse or a life-threatening condition that lands them in the intensive care unit. And while we might do things like starting antibiotics, offer respiratory support and cardiovascular support to support to get them through this health crisis, at some point, they're going to be having likely additional symptoms and additional questions about how much of this is causing symptoms that are beyond what they find acceptable and what we anticipate life might look like following this critical illness that someone's facing. And so when we start to think about palliative care in the ICU, what we're really asking ourselves to remember is that we can continue to check in with our patients and their families or surrogate decision makers about what matters most and what their preferences and values are and how that can be mapped onto what their clinical situation is at that time in light of current therapies that they have tried and maybe have worked, but also maybe haven't worked. And what we would want to do as a team to try to assure that we're honoring what patients most value during their um, health journeys. Yeah, and I, I think you raise a good point, which is, you know, things may change. Um, you may be facing a, an acute event where there really might be a, a role for aggressive therapy that can get you over that hump and, and back to your usual life. But sometimes there that aggressive therapy might not get you over that acute event. And and at some point, people may start to wonder whether that aggressive therapy is really futile in terms of their overall prognosis. So can you talk a little bit more about how those discussions are had with patients and their families? How much of this needs to be done before they ever hit the ICU? How much of it is done while they're in the ICU facing uh, this uh, acute crisis, um, and just give us a flavor of, of how those conversations take place. Sure. And, and, and thank you for kind of reading the, the changing story that might develop for that individual as they're thinking about what they would prefer in a vacuum before a crisis hits, and then how that might change over time. I think as 
much as people can, it's really helpful to talk with their loved ones and their surrogate decision maker kind of broadly about what matters most to them in terms of their day-to-day. And what I mean there is just trying to think about, you know, what it, what matters to you when you wake up each day. And if you can't do that or if that's taken away from you and the prospects of returning to it are very, very slim, you know, it, is life worth living, frankly? Um, but that's kind of morbid, so really hard for people to necessarily start to get into the weeds of. Um, So what we really are trying to help patients think about is what their preferences and values are in very broad brushstrokes. And it can be really hard to get into these conversations. I'll say my own family members are themselves hesitant to get into those conversations often. But then um, the surrogate decision makers or the the, uh, family members who are going to help with those decisions might want to continue to check in as things evolve for, for the patient's condition. And so in the ICU, what I urge us to do is do an early and often check-in and communication with patients and with their families. I try within the first day or two to identify myself as the attending physician for the patient who is in front of me and alert the patient and family what it is that I'm seeing and what I am planning to do and what sort of successes I'll be looking for, as well as what sort of hurdles I'm also anticipating and what contingencies I think I might have in front of me. I also, though, try to start to ask that, you know, we can continue to have these conversations as the patient's condition changes over time and try to assure that the there's some preparation for family members that this isn't going to be a one-time discussion and something that we We'll have to work on together um, if they're making the decision on behalf of their loved one or, you know, however the, the primary patient prefers decisions to be made. And so I think that, um, you know, just continuing to counsel patients and families about where we are as things change, uh, a, a mechanism that's often used in palliative medicine is saying things like we're in a different place right now. And I think there's no place like the ICU where that's going to be really resonating for subsequent decisions that are made for medical care. You know, I can imagine, though, that for some patients and and for their family members, making those decisions is really hard. I mean, because sometimes we just aren't ready to let go. Um, We maybe have not had closure uh, for some of the things that we needed to get closure on. We might have an existential crisis about what actually happens on the other side of this life. Um, we we might be really not quite at peace with letting go of our loved ones. And so those conversations can be really hard. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the team approach to um, take tackling those decisions. What kind of supports do we have to help families and and patients kind of get through those conversations? Because those conversations, in and of themselves, can be really difficult. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. And uh, I think the there are a few ways that we can approach this as a healthcare team. In the ICU, we have a fairly standard approach to at least offer chaplain services. Even folks who aren't necessarily religious uh, might find some comfort with that. But I think also just some humility to enter the patient's room and enter their world and find out what gives them comfort and trying to accommodate that while they're going through a very scary time that's potentially life-threatening can be really um, just really uplifting for patients and families as they were working through these very difficult and potentially very final decisions towards end of life for for patients who are in that place. But in addition to chaplaincy and spiritual support that people might identify, I think uh, things like like, um, visits with loved ones who matter to them, including furry friends, can make a difference. So I think that If there are ways to accommodate visits from a beloved pet, that also can go a really long way for bringing comfort to patients and their families. Um, Social workers can also help to navigate what we can do to best accommodate patients and their sort of additional roles that they're playing at home and how to try to keep things afloat as best they can. 
Um, but then I think also consultative palliative care services can really serve a huge lift for patients and families as they're working through some of these existential questions and some of these um, areas of uncertainty and, and unresolved sort of conflict and suffering that they might be carrying, but doesn't necessarily make its way to the top during our routine ICU rounds. So that can also be a place of additional support that the palliative care team can potentially serve. Can you talk a little bit more about you know, what exactly is this consultative palliative care service and the palliative care team? How, do, how does that work? What, what do they provide? Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. And before getting into that, I just want to distinguish that there are some primary palliative principles that are delivered by acute care providers in the hospital from the general wards to the intensive care units. And what I mean by that is sort of a a basic intake for what the palliative needs are for patients in terms of surrogate decision makers overall, as best we can estimate, goals of care for where they are at that time. And some attempt to identify um, current symptoms that somebody might be working through that we can help with. But that's that's sort of the, the floor of where we would start for palliative support. When we ask for a palliative consult team, we're asking for an, a, a multidisciplinary group of providers that includes nurse practitioners, physicians, uh, pharmacists, potentially uh, physical therapists, and, and other members of the team who help us to avoid polypharmacy, avoid medications that aren't helping and might be causing more adverse effects and uncomfortable symptoms for patients, while also working through the existential concerns, spiritual concerns, and uh, even some of the unknowable questions and answers that someone might be considering when they're in the ICU. And so the consultative team will come into the ICU and uh, get to know the patient and their family members, identify some of the subtleties of decision-making and support services and and support, um, support people and support styles that perhaps weren't necessarily evident to the primary treatment team in the ICU. The palliative team can then continue to participate in things like uh, goals of care conversations and other updates for patients and families, but then follow them out of the ICU during recovery while they're on the acute care ward or um, perhaps you know even in the outpatient setting that can also be offered for some additional palliative support. Yeah. As you talk about different support styles, I can't help but think about how every patient as an individual has their own cultural background, their own historical background. Um, Can you talk a little bit, or maybe we'll talk a little bit after the break, um, about how the team really fosters to the individual needs of each patient, their own their own individuality in terms of their culture and background. But first, we need to take a short break for a medical minute. So please stay tuned to learn more about palliative care for patients in the ICU with my guest, Dr. Kathleen Atgun. Funding for Yale Cancer Answers comes from Smilo Cancer Hospital, where their cancer genetics and prevention program includes a colon cancer genetics and prevention program that provides comprehensive risk assessment, education, and screening. SmiloCancerHospital.org. There are many obstacles to face when quitting smoking, as smoking involves the potent drug nicotine. Quitting smoking is a very important lifestyle change, especially for patients undergoing cancer treatment, as it's been shown to positively impact response to treatments, decrease the likelihood that patients will develop second malignancies, and increase rates of survival. Tobacco treatment programs are currently being offered at federally designated comprehensive cancer centers, such as Yale Cancer Center and at Smilo Cancer Hospital. All treatment components are evidence-based, and patients are treated with FDA-approved first-line medications, as well as smoking cessation counseling that stresses appropriate coping skills. More information is available at YaleCancerCenter.org. You're listening to Connecticut Public Radio. Welcome back to Yale Cancer Answers. This is Dr. Anise Chagpar, and I'm joined tonight by my guest, Dr. Kathleen Atgun. We're talking about palliative care for cancer patients in the ICU. 
what seems initially to be a bit of a an oxymoron, palliative care in the ICU, but we had talked a little bit about how cancer patients' journeys go up and down, um, and they may end up in ICU for an acute event, and that might be it, and then they can get back to their regular life. But sometimes things don't go as planned, um, or they don't get over that hump, and then they need to start thinking about what their long-term goals are, um, what their prognosis might be, what things are important to them, and at what point does aggressive medical treatment not make sense or might actually be more painful or more harmful than the life that they really want to lead. And Kathleen, right before the break, we were talking about the fact that, you know, cancer patients aren't all vanilla, right? Everybody has their own background, their own spirituality, their own religious uh, uh, affiliations, their own family traditions. And and so it's important that for a palliative care team to really understand a patient's background, that, that they have some knowledge and expertise on that. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, how palliative care teams actually do that, how they can address patients' individuality and, and really de- deliver what we often talk about on this show as pace patient-centered care, that personalized touch. Sure. And thank you for the question, Anise, and for setting up the challenges of living with cancer and how the ICU may be part of that journey for many of our patients. We've really witnessed a tremendous growth in what can be done to support people living with cancer and to develop cures that weren't imaginable just in the time I was applying to medical schools, most likely. And it's a much different landscape, and it's incredibly exciting. But at some point, our bodies are machines that are going to be exhausted, and there's not more that we could do. And so that's among the times that we're going to think about how having these open discussions and assuring patient-centered care is at the fore of what we do. But everybody is different, and we have population-level evidence for how to target these types of cancers, but how to provide comfort at the end of life for somebody and relieve suffering is something that is going to be very individualized for everybody. And so I think there's no uh, mystery to what we need to do. It's, it's really about human connections and exhibiting curiosity and humility for what would give that person the, the most sort of value for their day where they are currently, where we are in their journey. And I think that I've always been so surprised and just heartwarmed for what many patients are really looking for when they are starting to identify that this is a fight that they cannot continue to do in a way that's meaningful to them or or that is working for them because of the additional symptoms and, and difficulties that they might have. So I think just assuring patients and families that they're in the driver's seat for how decisions look and that as much as we can, we can be accommodating for what is going to bring them comfort at that stage can go a really long way. And and I think, you know, I think to your point of intellectual um, and moral humility is this idea of of asking patients about, you know, their traditions. I remember uh, we had a, a patient in the ICU who um, came from a, an Asian background where it was really important for her to be dressed in ceremonial robes um, as she approached um, her last moments. And, and it was wonderful to see that the ICU, like the place that we often think about as the hustle and bustle of acute care, was able to accommodate uh, that kind of request. So, Expand on that um, and, and talk about how the ICU can accommodate um, patients' requests like that or or having, you know, their own um, chaplain or or religious figure, whether it's a rabbi or an imam or, or, or any anybody that they want to be with them, with them, even in the ICU, which we often think of as a very restricted kind of environment. 
Sure. And those restrictions were unfortunately defining a lot of what was happening during the earlier parts of the 2020s because of the COVID pandemic. I think we've started to open our doors and return to more of that patient-centeredness that you were mentioning, Anise. Um, but in terms of how to systematically assure that we're checking in for what matters to patients, there are programs that have been developed by leaders in palliative ICU care that have really brought it down to things like three wishes. So what would be the three things that the patient might want given where they are today? And, you know, with a bit of creativity, there's a lot that we can do. We've we've seen, you know, in our local ICUs, we've seen, you know, weddings being able to be put together so that either the individual in the bed or their loved one can, can be married before that person dies. Um, we've seen pets being able to make visits. We've had spiritual advisors that are have been with the patient for decades being able to come and visit. But again, I think just asking those questions, perhaps distilling it down to something like a three wishes program can be a way that it's it's using sort of simple requests elicited from the patient and then a little bit of, of work on the side of the ICU team to identify what we can do. Of course, working with our nurse managers and hospital leaders to assure we're not violating any sort of guidelines in terms of the types of visitations we're speaking of. But it's it's often very simple requests that people are looking for and things that I think we can do um, if only we're just, you know, identifying these these requests for patient from patients. Yeah. You know, I've often thought about what I would answer if somebody said, you only have one wish or you only have three wishes. What would you wish for? And my answer would always be more wishes. Uh, <laughs> but but aside from that, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the formation of these, um, the palliative care team? I mean, y- you've talked about how all of the members on the team, they, they come from different backgrounds in terms of their medical expertise. You might have a pharmacist and a chaplain and a physical therapist and an oncologist. Um, but presumably, as each of these people are individuals, they also have different backgrounds in terms of their own history and their own culture. And, and that might also help in terms of meeting patients where they are. Absolutely. And so just as there's going to be a a wide range of disciplines to try to help patients um, and offer that support that palliative services can do, it's so critical that our workforce that's delivering that palliative care also looks like the patients who we're serving. And so I think that assuring that we are, you know, continuing to evaluate who we're recruiting into palliative care, because there's going to be potentially more trust when we are meeting people who can kind of identify with what our story is or what our childhood upbringing was or what our belief systems sort of developed into based on where we come from. And so I think making sure that we are not just having a cookie cutter approach for who goes into the palliative care team is really important for us to be able to meet the needs of patients that we're serving. You know, the other thing that I reflect on is that while we can provide all of this support and we can get patients and their families through very difficult uh, conversations and difficult situations as they approach the end of life and and provide patients with these three wishes often, I, I still wonder what people would say when they, they get me as a patient, but um, aside from that, for the more reasonable patients among us, um, you know, really helping them through this difficult time what happens after that patient passes? I mean, does the support for the family just end? Because I can imagine being a family in that situation and and feeling after that patient passes kind of empty, especially if all of the support stops. Can you talk a little bit more about caregiver support and, and bereavement support that might be offered? Yeah, and and again, you you really are so skilled at finding the important parts of palliative care in the ICU and palliative care beyond the ICU, which certainly this is touching on. And so, uh, bereavement support is another uh, very critical role that palliative care teams will play in helping to check in with patients and families to, or with families following the death of their loved one, 
because, you know, the, it's such a huge job to play as caregiver and you're both serving to help that that loved one through their medical journey, but also giving so much of yourself to try to keep them going, to get them to their appointments. And of course, there's the emotional toll that it's going to take as well, which can really, you know, lead to a lot of complicated um, and and um, sad feelings that can go on for quite a while and turn into more complicated grief and depression if if kind of gone unchecked. So it's not to suggest that palliative care can prevent that from happening necessarily, but I think assuring that family members and surrogate decision makers are getting that bereavement support afterwards is something that palliative care can also help with. And also we'll have networks identified in the community so that the surrogate decision maker or family member has areas they can go to to find support groups where they can further kind of identify people who've had similar situations or maybe someone that's a, a um, you know, been through such a situation where they can help to just, I don't know, just be able to work through what that grief feels like without feeling like they're bringing their friends down or, or just staying locked into that moment of their loss and not able to necessarily process it in other ways. And so I think that you know, freeing people up to uh, both express themselves if that's something that's important to them, but also finding groups that can be more maybe empathic to what that loss might feel like could potentially be another role that palliative services can do in the bereavement process. Yeah, and I, I think that's so important because, you know, many families who go through this process, right, you know, they will face that normal cycle of grief, right? Uh, and they, they will go through all of, you know, for anybody who has studied grief, right, all of the 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 the, the steps of, of grief until they get to acceptance. But some people really struggle. And, you know, that struggle doesn't end after a week or two weeks or six weeks or even six months. For some people, every year when that it's that anniversary they 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 go through this this really sad depression and they wonder is this normal uh, uh, you know uh, is there something wrong with me everybody says that i should just quote shake it off get on with my life but it's really hard and so you know knowing that there is ongoing support um, with support groups or counselors or um, even going back to your palliative care team with whom you may have really formed deep connections is is so important. Can you, can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Sure. And again, this is going to also be where the, um, the ways to work through this are going to be deeply personalized for the individual. But I think for Many people, it's it can be a mixed bag to return to that palliative service who, with whom you might have had this very intimate relationship with. So I think we need to be on guard on the palliative side of things that it can be its own triggering effect to be reaching out to someone if that's not something that they find helps for them. Dr. Kathleen Atgun is an associate professor of pulmonary medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. If you have questions, the address is canceranswers at yale.edu and past editions of the program are available in audio and written form at YaleCancerCenter.org. We hope you'll join us next week to learn more about the fight against cancer here on Connecticut Public Radio. Funding for Yale Cancer Answers is provided by Smilo Cancer Hospital.